tonight, we're going to uh, discuss some of the words that Jesus said and their meanings and apply those words and meanings to our present day life, as we always do. The passages of scripture that I want to deal with uh, this evening deals with lip service, uh, people that draws nigh or near, people who says wonderful and pleasing things to you with their mouth, but in their heart, they really mean just the opposite. You and I both know, and all of us has had enough experience in life to know and understand that sometimes the distance between a person's mouth and their heart as it pertains to you can be thousands, even light years apart. All the time what people says to you is not at all what they mean. And sometimes what is in their heart is really altogether different than what it is coming from their lips. Jesus said it this way in the book of Matthew, chapter 15 and verse 8. He said, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So the, the thing that matters, the thing that truly needs to be known, is what the condition of the heart is as to those who are helping us, pretending to help us, loving us, or telling us that they love us. What is the condition of their heart? Not the words that's coming out of their mouth. The Bible tells us that in the book of Revelation that the false prophet that will come in the last days during the tribulation period, the Bible says that he will have the appearance of a lamb. He will look like a Christian. He will look like a godly person. But the Bible says he will speak the words or from his mouth will come the words of the dragon, which the Bible says is the devil. So what the lips tell us and what the heart show us, because the heart is going to always operate according to action. It's going to operate according to deed. It's going to operate accord, according to the doing of a thing. The lips can simply say and the mouth will simply say whatever it needs to say to disguise what the intent of the heart really is. And again, I'm not breaking any new news to any of you. You've all run across this from time to time. But listen, as I've shared with you in times past, the most important thing in this world is that we, is that mankind as a whole, possess the gifts of God and primarily the gift of the discerning of spirits. I've shared it with you many times before, but as I've told you before, this program is not about bringing something new to you every week. It is trying to get these principles instilled in your heart so that you will not be used, you will not be taken advantage of, you will not be abused, and our homes, our businesses, our relationships, or our nation, or our world, collapse before us and utterly be destroyed because we are the type of person who simply believes whatever comes out of another person's mouth and we have no, no desire whatsoever to investigate what the person is actually doing, what their heart actually says they are actually up to. So it is the discerning of spirits, the gift God gave us, so that we may know who it is and what it is that we are dealing with. Without it, it is the blind leading the blind and you will both fall into a ditch. You must have that gift. So the Lord is making it clear to us that there are those who says one thing and they mean another. The difference between the distance of the mouth, the lips, and the heart, it must be discerned. Now, the second thing and the second passage that I want to read to you comes from, comes from the book of 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. It says, feed the flock, as the Bible is speaking of the elders of the church, feed the flock which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, that is, not willingly, not being made, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, not for money, but of a ready mind. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. 
So the Bible is telling us here that we are not to lord over one another. That is one of the wonderful things in the Bible. From the pulpit to the back pew of the church, there is no hierarchy set up in the house of God. There are those who knows the Bible. There are those who have been called, as the scripture says, are apt to teach, all of which is vitally important. The person who is given the gift of teaching or is apt to teach, able to express their points and get them across, well, that's the person that you want to teach those who's coming in. It doesn't mean that the person in the back row of the church does not have as much knowledge as the preacher or anyone else in the church. It is the same with school today. You see it everywhere you turn. There are people in schools and teachers in school today who certainly knows their subject who passed it with flying colors, coming out of school and going through college and getting a degree and, and thoroughly knowing their subject. But they cannot teach it. They can't get it across. They can't make people grasp it because they don't have the ability to teach. Because you have learned something does not mean that you're apt to teach it. You know it, but you're not apt to teach it. There's more things involved in teaching a person something than simply telling them how it works. Different strokes for different folks, different children, different adults need things put to them in different ways and it is the teacher's duty to find out what the best means of presentation is. Not the common knowledge, it's there, but the best means of presentation to help those that are there to grow. And what we never do is we never lord over one another. For what you are dealing with in the church is the heritage of God. And God is the Lord of those people. And God is your Lord. And so you do not lord over those people. So these two things is what I want to build the program around tonight to use these things to manifest to you, which is my job, to manifest to you those who say one thing, whose hearts prove that their intention is altogether different. For those who, well, see you as children and treat you with contempt and in so doing, destroy you. Now, I want to bring focus into the African-American community. Well, I should do that, and there be, should be nothing wrong with me doing it. Uh, it's the focal point of the news all the time. It's the focal point of politics and politicians all the time. It's the focal point of almost everything in society. So I want to focus on the black community this evening, and I want to help you see the difference between lip and heart. I want you to see those who have contempt over you and with an evil heart to use you has used you, and you've been the source of making them enormously wealthy while they have kept you in the inner city where you are and worse. The first point that I would bring out to you, African American community, is this. Something that we would call food for thought. I'm just asking you to think about it. There is in the government no Korean caucus. There is in the government no Hawaiian caucus. No Indian caucus. There is no Japanese caucus. There is only a black caucus. The simple fact of the business is, is that black America, African Americans, 100 to 150 times more than every other group in this nation, including white. The African American is represented a hundred to 150 times more than any group in this entire nation. 
This means, black man, that you have more governmental rep representation than anybody in the country. But yet in the inner city, you are not only where you was, but you are worse off than you was. While the members of the black caucus, the only such caucus that there is, no Indian caucus, no Japanese caucus, no Korean caucus, just a black caucus. You got the highest representation and the only people that gets rich and getting rich and doing better are the people representing you. While you are not only not getting better, but in the inner city, you are continually getting worse and worse with the greatest by far of representation from the government of the United States of America. That should cause one to pause and think. How can you have, how can I have the, by far the most representation and yet I am supposedly the lowest on the pole? Well, it can only mean one thing. As the old saying goes, with friends like this, who needs an enemy? Once again, those that has represented you has gotten richer and richer and richer and richer. Now, they say the corporate America is getting richer and richer and people's getting poorer and poorer. Well, listen to me, brothers and sisters. Whenever you build a business and you produce goods and you sell those goods, that is the goal of everyone who does such a thing. Sell more, get more, get richer. That's why you build a business. My concern is not that corporate America's getting richer. They're supposed to. You build a business, you're supposed to get richer. My concern is, as we are focusing on the black community, my concern is, is how the members of the black caucus goes in just normal pay scale people and they come out multimillionaires representing you by far more than anyone else is represented. And you remain the same and worse. Please think about this point as we refer back to what the Lord Jesus said about the lips and the heart. The lips being close and the heart being far. There really is no other way to explain what I've just presented to you. Not barely represented, not, not, not a little more represented. You are the most represented people in the entire nation and by far inside the United States government and the people that represent you get richer and richer and richer while you get poorer and in the inner cities worse off every year. Just simply asking you to think about it. Then we come to the contempt thing. We come to a group of people, well, the Black Caucus, Barack Obama, the leaders, that has been elected by African Americans over them to do the very thing, speak to blacks with contempt, to speak to blacks as if they own them, to speak to adult grown African Americans as if they are children. Well, this contempt manifests an opinion an opinion of which these people have for you that they call my people. Great swelling words and lip services, but a heart that gets themselves richer and their people, as they call them, poorer and poorer and in the inner city, worse and worse. Simple facts. Now, I'm going to show you Barack Obama back during the campaign, 
speaking to a group of African Americans and him concerned with only one thing, his legacy. The man has had more than $18 million worth of vacations in eight years. African American in the inner city, how many vacations you had? $18 million this man has. And he is with contempt speaking to his people and commanding them they better preserve his legacy. Well, African American, inner cities, ghettos, Detroit, wherever you may be watching, what about your legacy? That's what you should think about when you hear this. What about my legacy, Mr. President? Children and a wife, family, mamas and daddies who sees me as a winner and a provider, but you've done nothing in Chicago but got us killed. You've done nothing for eight years but lowered our pay. You've done nothing in eight years but turned our homes in the inner cities into nothing but ghetto war fields. And you commanding us to preserve your legacy? Ask yourself, black man, what about my legacy? Especially in the African American community, I will consider it a personal insult an insult to my legacy if this community lets down its guard and fails to activate itself in this election. You want to give me a good send off? Go vote! There is no right-minded politician that would speak to his constituents in that manner, except that he think he owns you. But it goes back to the Jesse Jacksons and the Al Sharptons as far back as you want to go that the black man was told by Mr. Jackson and by Barack Obama and by Al Sharpton and by Louis Farrakhan, when you black and when you not. You black when you do what I tell you to do. When you preserve my legacy and my money, you a black man then. But you ain't black till I tell you you black. That's been going on for years. Could I play you clips of those very words over and over and over and over and over again? I certainly could. And what is it but contempt? And it should make you sick to your stomach. No one, as I said, no one would speak to their constituents, their members. No one would speak to them that way except they think that they own you. You their children. They your daddy. They own you. And that is exactly what they believe. They are the new owners. Owners. Those who lord over. And if that contemptuous speech right there does not prove my point, nothing else will. But we'll give you another one where he speaks to his children out on the campaign trail just a few months ago. Hey, 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 hey. Listen up. Hey, everybody. Everybody. Hey. Hey. Listen up. Hey. I told you to be focused, and you're not focused right now. Listen to what I'm saying. Hold up. Hold up. Sit down and be quiet for a second. Everybody sit down and be quiet for a second. No human being would speak to another group of people in that contempt unless he thinks he owns you. And he does think that he owns you. And the Black Caucus think that they own you. And it's time now, my black brothers and sisters, to come alive and realize and wake up and understand that all they did 
was moved the chain from your ankle to your brain. That's a fact. They think they own you because up to this point, they have. But what their lips has promised you, their hearts has only taken it for themselves. Now let's go to point two. That this group of people that call themselves Democrats, this group of people, whatever they cry about, whatever they squall about, whatever they bring to the central focus in the news, is always what they're doing. What they condemn others for, it's always what they're doing. Uh, now, Mr. Trump, of whom I'm not here to support, we're going to wait and see what he is. We're going to see, wait and see what he does. We don't know yet. But just as I said eight years ago, going into Barack Obama's administration, we're going to give him a chance. I say the same thing with Mr. Trump. Let's give him a chance. Here's the point. The point is, is they have raked him over the coals, accusing him of being in love with Russia and wanting a relationship with Russia. Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, with no evidence and no proof of anything but that he's looking kind toward Russia and nice towards Russia. Well, going back to the last campaign for presidency, Mr. Romney had clear eyes on Vladimir Putin and on Russia, and it was Barack Obama who was condemning Mr. Romney for wanting to go back to the policies of the 1980s, which was dead and gone. Russia is not a problem. They will be our friends. When you were asked what's the biggest geopolitical threat facing America, you said Russia. Not Al-Qaeda. You said Russia. In the 1980s are now calling to ask for their foreign policy back because you know, the Cold War has been over for 20 years. Russia, I indicated, is a geopolitical foe. Not a, Number one. Excuse me. It's a geopolitical foe. And I said in the, same, in the same paragraph, I said, and Iran is the greatest national security threat we face. Russia does continue to battle us in the UN time and time again. I have clear eyes on this. I'm not going to wear rose-colored glasses when it comes to Russia or Mr. Putin. So just four years ago, it was Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and the Democrats who thought that Russia had been mistreated and wanted to be buddies and friends with them. And so he corrected Mr. Romney. And he was then saying Iran was our biggest problem. Russia was not. Well, Romney proved right. And the one that Mr. Obama was saying was our biggest problem and our biggest threat, Iran, Mr. Obama gave them $158 billion plus more while they were shouting and their leaders proclaiming death to America. Go figure this out. Whatever these people are squalling about, whatever these people that call themselves Democrats are squalling about, always know it's because they are doing it. Miss Clinton took a reset button to the Russians to reset our relations. I wanted to uh, present you, which represents what President Obama and Vice President Biden and I have been saying. And that is, we want to reset our relationship. And so we will do it together. <laughs> Thank you very much. You are Thank very you. welcome. We worked hard to get the right Russian word. You think you, we got it? You get this wrong. You can almost just feel the love just dripping from the Obama administration and his Secretary of State toward the Russians, of whom now they highly condemn, who has been hacking our stuff known for eight years, and not a word said about it. Then there was the open mic situation. Well, Mr. Obama didn't know that he was on mic, that he was being recorded, talking to one of the Russian leaders. This is what he said. This is my last election day, please. Yeah. After my election, I have more flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. 
I transmit this information to Vladimir and Ms. Denver. There's a whole lot of love there being passed between Mr. Obama and the Russian leaders. And what he meant by send it to Vladimir that uh, this is my last election and after I'm reelected, I'll have a lot more flexibility. Number one, how did he know he was going to be reelected? Re Number two, what was the subject matter pertaining to that he would have a lot more flexibility? Nobody knows. But we do know this. He gave the Middle East to Russia. And now this bunch is complaining about Donald Trump and Russia. Whatever they squall about, whatever they cry about, this corrupt bunch is always dead in the middle of doing it. Should 